sitting with a, a friend of mine, a pastor friend of mine, whose name is Wes Davis. He was here last year with us in our church in the, in the month of January, and we were having a coffee um, in Seattle, and over a conversation with him, I was talking about our church and talking about how do we take um, Capstone from the place that it is to a place where it becomes a church that is, you know, mission-minded, that, um, that is a church that is sending church rather than, you know, a church that gathers people into one place. I want to be, a pl I want to be at a place where I want to see our church grow. Um, and when we were talking that conversation with him, uh, we, you know, we, we both were talking with each other. He picked up this napkin. We were sitting in a Starbucks. Um, and, and uh, you know, uh, over a coffee. And so since, since we were at, 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 at Starbucks, he just picked up the napkin uh, from there. And um, he asked me, hey, if I give you this napkin um, and ask you to draw the dream that you have for the church, what would you draw there? That was the question that he asked me. Um, this is not the napkin, of course, but, but that was the question that he asked me. And that's why you got a napkin in your hand. So I'm asking you the question today. Um, the napkin is not to wipe your tears or clean your hands. This is, this is, uh, the, the, the reason I gave you this napkin is to ask you the question. What if I ask you the question? Write out your dream on the napkin that is given to you, this blank one. If you ever have a dream, not the dream of getting married, not the dream of buying a car. You know, don't, don't, I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about you know, something that you really want to do in your life. At some point, before you take your last breath on the earth, what is that one thing that you dream of, that you want to achieve in your life? What is that dream? If I ask you to write it down, or maybe draw it, what would you draw? If I ask the same question, the napkin dream question to Joseph, if Joseph was sitting this you know, opposite to me at Starbucks, and I ask him, hey, Joseph, what is your napkin dream? Um, this is probably how, what he would draw uh, in his napkin, right? Uh, when he um, draws it, right? That's probably what he would draw. So if I ask you the question, the same question, what would you write? Most people don't know what to write. Most people don't know what to draw there. And it's okay, there's nothing wrong with that. Blank napkin is a good place to start. That's why we gave you the blank napkin and a pen along with that. Because we believe that God gives us dreams. Dreams that he would want to accomplish through our lives. That he would want to use our lives by helping us to achieve that dreams. In the process, he would bring healing to the world around us, through us, through our dreams through what he wants to do with us. That's what he did with Joseph's life. You don't, you, you know, you just don't want to live your life, whole life, in a place where you don't really know uh, what you want to do with, you, with yourself and with your life. But we want you to start believing that God has a dream for your life and, and get that idea into your head. I want you to know this. This is your big idea for today. Even if you don't listen to the rest of the message, listen, remember this and go away from here. Isn't this? You were made to make a difference. You may not agree with me with that, but you were made to make a difference. You see, most people live their life in three modes, one of these three modes. Number one, most people, by the way, if, if you, you have notes, you have notes that it's printed, you have notes on the phone, at version, you can just go to version Bible, Click on events, you will see Capstone Church there. Click on Capstone, you will have these notes. Just keep, keep typing into that. Most people live their lives in one of these three modes. Number one, it's, let's call that survival mode. I guarantee that a lot of people, maybe not in this group, in this group that is sitting right now, uh, um, but most people in this world live in survival mode. All they can think through, all they can think is just to get through this week. Well, actually, not even this week. Just get, get through one day. One Monday morning. One Monday morning. While all of us have our own survival movements, we are not made to live our life to live like that. You see, that's not really living at all. It's 
almost like an ex existing, just like how a rock, a dog, or, a, a, or some, uh, some kind of tree exists. Uh, you're not made to exist like that. You're made to do something more than surviving. Say some of us live all our lives only to just to get through the weekend. All you live is for the weekend. You're on survival mode. When you feel that you are controlled by your circumstances, you're on sur survival mode. Uh, when you find yourself consistently thinking, I wish I was in some other place, I wish I was in some other country, I wish I was married to somebody else, <laughs> you're in survival mode. Most people in this world live in that mode, survival mode. But some people, like you, have moved from survival mode to what I want to call a success mode. That's a second mode. I can give a guarantee that most of you probably are in this you know, bracket of people, those who understand that, uh, you know, I've got to be successful in life, not just survive, but I've got to do something, achieve something with my life. Whether you know it or not, most of you here today, in this place, right now, in, in, in the church, we're sitting in Lemon Tree, by world standard, you are in success mode. Two years ago, we did a series called Money Matters. I don't know if you remember that. Talked about how to manage your finances, how does God look at your money and you know, all that stuff. And I made a very important observation through, you know, the, 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 um, and, and, and told you this, that in India, all of you who are sitting here right now, in India, you are in the top 10% richest people in India. All of you. You may not like it, you may not agree with me, but you are in that bracket. There are a lot of people in India, 90% of them, who live well below um, poverty line. Well below what you spend in one single day. You know, they'll have that, they will earn that in one month. So don't tell me that you know, you're a struggling, growing person. You're actually a rich person. So in that sense, you are a successful person. Uh, we have, you live in a comfortable home, maybe a comfortable hostel. Uh, you have money. You have money to go to a movie. You have money to go to a restaurant. You can buy, you can swiggy and eat. Uh, even after your mom cooks, you still swiggy and eat. Uh, that's what swiggy is teaching us right now, right? Uh, you have some measure of success in your life. And yet, I understand that many of you sitting here still feel unfulfilled. Still feel that as if there is something that is not quite right with, our, with your life. I am successful, I don't know why I still feel unfulfilled. The answer is that it takes more than success to satisfy. Feel fulfilled in our lives. That you need something deeper. Something that you understand that, hey, my life is not about just myself, it's about making a difference. That's when you'll become fully alive. That's when you'll begin to see that there's something that drastically happens, and I want to call that the significance mode. You move from success mode to a place where we all need to be in, and that's what, that's what God's plan for our life is, that we live in success, significance mode. Listen to this, you're not an accident. You are made, God made you to make a difference. God knew you even before you were born. You were made by God and you were made for God. You were created for His glory. There may be, listen, there may, be unplanned, uh, there may be unplanned pregnancies, but there are no unplanned people on this earth. God planned each one of you to be here. To be at the place that you are in today. To be in the state that you are in today, right now. God planned it. He knew you even before you were born. He knew where you would be born. He knew what kind of name you're going to get. He knew the kind of dumb decisions that you would make and that would hurt others. He also knew all the dumb decisions that others would make which would hurt you. He knew the kind of circumstances you go through, you will go through, you, you are going to go through. You matter to God. You are made to live forever. 
and that's a pretty significant thing. You see, God loves you and He has a dream for your life. Um, so therefore, remember this, you're made to make a difference. That's His assignment for you in this world. My prayer is this, that, <coughs> that while you may start today with a blank napkin in your hand, that by the end of this series, over the next eight weeks, you will come to a place where you will be able to write down what you're dreaming of. What do you want to do with your life? That you not only just write a dream that God gives you in the process of seeking for it, that you would push for it, that you would actually do something to achieve it. And one person who has done that in the scriptures is Joseph. And that's why we picked up Joseph's life. We want to journey along with Joseph. This boy, when he was 17 years old, began to dream. And how did he see that dream? come into fulfillment in his life. So this whole journey uh, um, that we're going to take over the next eight weeks is to find out life principles that we can take from Joseph's life and his journey towards fulfillment of his dream uh, so that we can also follow them and see our dream come into fulfillment. Does it make sense? Today, I just want to do an intro message um, by making a simple observation from Joseph's life. Joseph gets introduced to us in the book of Genesis chapter 37. That's the first time we get to see Joseph. Joseph, uh, the, the verses begin like this, Jacob settled again in the land of Canaan. That means he was there before, then he traveled to some other place, came back again and settled in Canaan now, where his father had lived as a foreigner. So when his father was there, that's when Jacob was there in the land of Canaan. Then he ran away from there. You remember that he cheated Isaac and, you know, Isa, uh, and Isaac uh, took the blessing away and then, you know, ran to his uncle's place and then after many years he's now come back and he's settling in land of Canaan. This is the account of Jacob. Jacob by now has four wives, 12 children, his family. When Joseph was 17 years old, Joseph was the last one who was born. There's another guy who was born after that but at that point of time Joseph is the youngest one. He was 17 years old. He, was, uh, he often tended his father's flocks. He worked for his half-brothers the sons of his father's wives, Bilha and Zilpha. But Joseph reported to his father some of the bad things. Well, actually, I think the uh, writer is more kind. Joseph reported all the bad things his father, his, you know, his brothers were doing to his father. Have you ever had a younger brother like that? Uh, I had a younger sister like that. <laughs> J J Jacob loved Joseph more than any of his other children because Joseph had been born to him in his old age. So one day Jacob had a special gift made for Joseph, a beautiful robe. We'll talk about robe next week. But his brothers hated Joseph because their father loved him more than the rest of them. And they couldn't say a kind word to him. Let me make an observation here. I'm going to make four observations about Joseph's dream. The next verse, just the beginning of it. One night, Joseph had a dream. One night, Joseph had a dream. Before Joseph had a dream, as a 17-year-old boy, a dream that he's, of course, going to talk about it to his brothers, a dream that he knew, that, that, that kind of showed him that he's, go, he's not just an ordinary guy, he's going to do something extraordinary through his life, he's going to be a different guy. A dream, before he dreamt that dream, something happened there that kind of helped him, nudged him towards dreaming something like that. And that's my first observation, um, um, you know, that I want you to take away with you uh, today. Um, the, number one is this, that people who feel special dream about doing something significant. People who feel special dream about doing something significant with their lives. Let me just go back to those verses and then we'll come back again here. The story, you know, the, the, the verses, the first four verses that you, you, you see um, talk about how Jacob showed favoritism. By the way, as a father and as a mother, if you show favoritism in, in your home, your, your family is going to be dysfunctional. Remember that. Um, let's talk about Jacob later. Jacob is not the subject of topic in our, our discussion right now. Uh, Joseph is. But 
I, I want to just focus on Joseph for today. I'll come to Jacob some other time. But for now, Joseph. But as parents, we need to remember that. No favoritism at home. The moment you do that, you're going to have trouble in your home. You see, there is no problem in um, making a coat for Joseph. The problem was, he should have made the same coats for the rest of the 11 too. And because he didn't do that, his brothers hated Joseph. That's all. Now, let's just stay with Joseph. Okay? Uh, jo look at this. From the time he was born, father loved him. Till the time he's 17 years old, um, everything that father had done showed Joseph that his father loved him. That he is a favorite son of his father. The things that his father brought to him, the things that his father gifted him, made him feel special. He also knew that father treated him more than his brothers, you know, the well, more than his brothers. So Joseph came to, as he grew up, came to his teenage years and, and uh, in, in, in his adulthood uh, as a person who began to think that he is a special person. And the moment he realized he is somebody who is special, he began to dream. He began to dream of doing something significant with his life. That's the observation. That's all. People who don't feel special don't dream about doing something significant with their lives. People who feel that they are useless, that their life means nothing, don't actually dream about anything, you know, to do something significant with their lives. They are always confined to the survival mode. You probably had people in your life who made you to feel like that, feel that way, that you're not special, you're not, you know, maybe they may not say you're not special, but the way they treat you, the things that they say to you, they yell at you, make you feel that you're nobody. And because you grew up with people like that, who constantly reminded you uh, that you're just another guy, ordinary guy, you stopped dreaming about your own life, you stopped thinking bigger than yourself, bigger than surviving one day. On the opposite spectrum, maybe there are people in this place who have had family members, who have had friends, who have had uh, mentors in your life, who made you feel special, who constantly reminded you <clears throat> that you are, you are born with a purpose, that your life means something, that you are made to make a difference. You had a father who loves God, who constantly reminded you that God loves you, that you are made for something different, something good with your life. And that's probably why you are here sitting. That's probably why you are dreaming bigger than yourself. That's why even though you were born in a small little village, you chose to, to, to choose not to confine yourself to that place, not to allow your circumstances to, to decide how you're going to spend the rest, rest of your life, but you chose to break through that because somebody believed in you. In your capacity, somebody made you feel special. That's the point. When you begin to feel special, you begin to dream bigger. You begin to dream about, I want to do something with my life. Something great, something significant, something that, something that marks, you know, that kind of, I, I leave a mark on this world when I leave from here. Listen to me. I don't know how people made you feel, special or not special, good or useless, I don't know. But I want you to know this, that you are really special. The reason you are really special is because, number one, you are made in the image of God. Do you know how special that is? That of all the things in the creation, of all the things that God created, God chooses to impart his DNA into you chooses to impart his image into you, choose to give you the one thing that he doesn't give to any other creature, including angels, free will that only he has. The capacity to choose between good and bad, the capacity to choose whatever you want to do. Do you know we are the only people who have that, that, that privilege, that honor to choose anything? Angels don't have. Angels, even though they are greater than us, in their power, they still don't have that. You and I have that image imprinted on us. God must be really 
crazy, you know, to give us that. He must be crazily in love with us that he chooses to give his DNA to us. You are special. You may not agree with me right now, but I want you to know you are truly special. You are made to make a difference. He helped you to go through what you are going through today, what you have gone through before, all your strengths, all your gifts that He had given you, all the pains that you have gone through, all the weaknesses that you have overcome, all the strengths that you have gained, all the experiences that you have had. God is actually using all that to shape you to become a person to heal the world that is around you. Do you know our church, the, the vision statement for our church is people becoming the church on the mission with Jesus to help heal the world. I believe God called us to be people who become the church. Not people who come to the church, but who become the church. That's why I don't believe in buildings, you know, building just the steeple buildings. I believe people are the church. God believes in individuals. He considers you his church. People becoming the church, but it's the mission of God. On the mission with Jesus. For what? To bring healing to this world. It's not, I want you to know this. Remember this today. It's not who you are that makes you special. It's whose you are that makes you special. Who you belong to that makes you special. You belong to a God who loves you so much that not only He makes you in His image, but He makes sure that you remain in that image by allowing His Son to come to this world to take our form, human form, Paul calls it nothing, you know that? He says, he became nothing when he took the human form. And take death upon himself so that you and I can live. That we can do all the crime, we can live with all the wickedness and evil, commit adultery, commit rebellious, uh, rebellious things against God, and yet go unpunished because of Jesus. I'm not saying you do that now, okay? But imagine the kind of love that God showed by taking all that you have done in the past, doing today, and will do tomorrow, and threw it upon Christ so that we can then freely come to Him and ask for forgiveness and receive forgiveness and become part of His family by doing nothing except by believing in the cross. You are that special to God. That he makes you in his image and he makes sure his image remains intact by sacrificing Christ on the cross. So that's why you are special, not because of who you are, but because to who you belong to. It's you, it's who you belong to that makes you special, really. So this tells me this, that our dreams are not about us, it's all about Jesus actually. So if I ask you, how does your dream, does your dream point to Jesus? But if you are Joseph at this point of time, at this juncture, where he had the dream, it's actually hard to tell. Let's go there. Um, that verse, verses 5. One night Joseph had a dream. And when he told his brothers about it, they hated him more than ever. Listen to this dream, he said. We were out in the field tying up the bundles of grain. Suddenly my bundle stood up. All of you, your bundles, all, are, all gathered around and bowed low before mine. Well, if you look at this dream, um, it's hard to tell who is at the center. Well, it's actually clear that Joseph is at the center of this dream. Um, so I'm going to actually try and talk you out of that today. Here is the second observation that I've learned um, while looking at Joseph's life is this. First, people who, speci who feel special begin to dream bigger, right? Number two, most people, most dreams start off self-centered. Most dreams start off self-centered. It's okay. You see, if you... If I ask you to tell me your dream, 
And if you keep saying the my dream, I, then it simply means you are in the center of the dream. That's all it means. Have you ever had somebody to whom you ask this question, tell me your dream, my brother. And that brother looks at you and says, my dream is to help your dream. Have you ever seen somebody like that? Or did you have somebody who would look at you and say, my dream is to become your servant? No. All our dreams are going to be you know, drawn or written down at a, in, a, in a way that, that shows that we are going to be on the top. That it is everybody who is following us. It is everybody who is standing up and taking notice of us. It is every, the whole world is going to watch us how good we are with our talents, how good we are with our education, how good we are with our knowledge. We want people to stand up and notice. That's why we want, we want dreams. You know? we, want, we want a dream bigger. Most dreams start off like that. They start off self-centered. Um, ask yourself that question. If God actually, this question, ask if, if God actually make your dream, the dream that you have right now. I'm sure some of you have dream already. Some of you may not have, you are still the blank paper. But it's okay. But if you had a dream, and then God actually brings that dream into fulfillment. If God does that, what difference would it make in this world? If you can answer that question, then, then you are not in the center of the dream. But if you cannot, if you are stumbling, struggling to find an answer for it, then you are the center of your dream. I'm, I'm, going to, I'm, going to be, I'm, I'm going to say this, that maybe because you're at the center of your dream, you're finding it hard uh, to take the faith steps towards what God wants you to do. If someone walked up to you, uh, maybe a genie in the bottle walked up to you and asked you and said, hey, you know, I'll give you whatever you want. Anything you ask, I'm going to do that for you. What would you say? Whatever it is um, that you're going to say would probably be the most accurate picture of what um, the idea that you have about heaven, you know. It's your personal heaven. Um, like I want, I want everything that I want. I want all the money in this world. I want, uh, I don't have to work. I, can, I, I want to have a new car, um, the best car in this world. Uh, I, can, I, can, I can eat whatever I want and never gain weight and you know, all that. That personal heaven. The trouble is this, that if there is really a genie who's going to offer you all that, uh, and, and offer you a personal heaven, is that when you get there, it won't be long before you realize it's not really a heaven. Think with me. If you didn't have to work, you got all the money in this world whatever money you wanted, what would you do if you're not working and you got money? I can give a guarantee that most of us would probably take world tours, you know, traveling. Um, you'd start traveling, have fun, buy stuff, go to New Zealand, do a bungee jump. Um, I don't know what else you can do, just thinking. Then come home. In all this journey, you are going to take pictures of it, you're going to do selfies while you're doing bungee jump, and then post it onto Insta while you're jumping, you know, all that. Uh, you, you can do that, all, I know. And you, you probably would come back home, talk about it to your friends, tell all the adventures that you have done, and then plan what to do next. Then maybe you will go to another world trip, another round of trip, another places that you have never explored. You travel, you travel, you do whatever you can, you spend all the money that you got, you come back home, and still you're going to think what to do next. That's not heaven. Or maybe your heaven, for, for people like me, is that you get a new car. Uh, I have a good car. <laughs> I don't need another car. I'm just saying. Yeah, you would have a new car. Okay, so you got a new car. The car, the best car that is available in the market, the one with the heated seats and three climate control and, and digitally enhanced driver instrument panel, you know, it's heaven. Until next year, 
you get to see a new car that your friend bought. And now that car has got rain sensing, windshield wipers, voice control, navigation system, refined air, ride, suspension. Some of you girls are looking at me like, what's wrong with you, man? Okay, the first class jet set atmosphere. Now that is heaven when you look at his car. The problem is at that time your car becomes hell. Making sense now? So um, you feel trapped, and you know, and you don't really know. Uh, you want to think you, you, it's time to upgrade, right? You go to the next one. The thing is, I realized this: that we do the same things in our relationships, in our jobs, in everything that we do. As long as we are in the center of our dreams, that's why we're chasing happiness like we are chasing a wind. If your dream has you at the center, it's not big enough. Too small. Too easy to do. Turn the arrows out. Stop thinking about yourself. Now turn the arrows out. Make your dream something about people knowing how good God is. Make your dream something about how do we help people to know that there is a God who loves them. Get out of the center of your dream. If you don't, God can actually help you. He did that with Joseph. Uh, God will help you. Ask him. Please help me. And God did that. This is how he did. And we'll come to that two weeks from now. What, look at the way his brothers responded now. His brothers responded. So you think you'll be our king? Do you actually think that you will reign over us? They got really mad now. I will say, and they hated him all the more. They already hate him. They already hate him because the father is showing favoritism. Then their anger got more because he's now this boy, little boy, is going to his father and talking about his, you know, all, all, all that the brothers are doing, all the bad things that the brothers are doing. So they hated him more. Their anger, got, you know, they, their anger increased. Now they came to a point where they hated him so much they want to kill him. That's how much they hated him because of his dreams and the way he talked about them. That's what the Bible says, verse 8. So here is the third observation. I want you to remember this. That not everyone is going to like your dreams. Starting probably with your brother. Not everybody in your family is going to be appreciative of your dream. They are not going to be encouraging. Maybe some of you already have people like that in your home. Not everybody is going to like your dream, especially if you are in the center of it. Do you actually think you are going to reign over us? That's what caught them off guard. That's what made them more angry. You remember, that's what he, he, they said. Uh, they, 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 were, they hated him more because of his dreams. That's one thing. But they hated him more because of the way he talked about it. So he kept telling, I'm the guy, I'm the guy who's going to be the king over you. Imagine a little lad talking to you. The oldest brother had sons almost at the age of Joseph. Oldest brother of Joseph had children who were as big as Joseph. Talking to him like that would have really, you know, ticked him off. The brothers ticked them off. In that culture, the one in charge would be the oldest one. Unfortunately, Jacob, parents, that's why it's a strong reminder to you. Unfortunately, Jacob took the favorite, this coat, this coat of multicolors, and put it over Joseph. In that culture, it's almost as if the father is declaring to everybody else, because I'm giving the best to my, this son, he would be the in charge. Do you understand? That's a symbolical, symbolic way of saying that. That he's the boy, he's the in charge. So, um, Joseph was the youngest and he developed um, this old, older complex, you know, that because of his father. He goes out with a special, a special coat and tries to boss over his brothers. His brothers were sent into the field to work and Joseph was to, send, Joseph was to go and oversee their work and report it back. That basically makes him the in charge. 
the youngest one became the in charge of the entire family that really got them frustrated so not everyone is going to like your dream um now some of it may be because of jealous people are jealousy because people are jealous about you but some of it because they have wounds caused by you like joseph did to his brothers through his attitude through the way he talked we'll come to that next week next week is going to be very important don't miss next sunday that message especially that's probably why he experienced a pushback from his brothers that's probably why some of you are experiencing a pushback in your in your dreams because pe- people you thought would stand along with you are supposed to stand along with you or pushing you back because you are in the center of your dream maybe god is using criticism maybe god is using people who are pushing you back to tell you a message that send you a message that man you got to get out of the center i got to come in there maybe that's what god was trying, god is trying to teach you i noticed this that most of my life till i got liberated from it i struggled uh, about um, uh, about what people think of me the the first part of my ministry journey as a as a pastor was always about that how will people like me will will they respect me i'm too young to be a pastor to um dumb to be a pastor whatever <laughs> you know uh, and i always struggled how, will people ever accept me till god taught me stop thinking about yourself man it's not about you capstan is not even about you when you move out of the center of your dream stop worrying about whether people are going to like you and praise you people should not because you're not god anyway then god can enter into the center and you will begin to see strangely people start responding it differently now see it doesn't matter what people think about you it only matters what they say about god when they see him through you so just because people discouraged you just because circumstances are not um are not going according to uh, how you planned them to go just because you, you know you've been waiting for the dream to come to fulfillment for last 5 years maybe 7 years some of you are waiting till last for, for last 10 years just because nobody is encouraging you don't give up on your dream just move out of the center of your dream and then you will see that dream starts moving making progression soon joseph had another dream again he told his brothers about it listen i've had another dream he said the sun moon and 11 stars bowed low before me this time he told the dream to his father this guy must be crazy as well as his brothers you know if it was my father he would have broken my legs talking to him like that his father scolded him um this is what loving people loving parents do huh? by the way they will scold you if your attitude is wrong it's a good thing he scolded him what kind of dream is that the words um, may sound little harsh he goes on to say will your mother and i and your brothers actually come and bow bow to the ground before you but while his brothers were jealous of joseph his father wondered what the dreams meant i love that that shows what a loving parent do they may scold you they may sound harsh to you but they will not forget what you tell them your dreams i'm sure jo- joseph as he uh, J- jacob as he put the dream of joseph in his heart and began to wonder about it he he wondered what is his role as a parent to help this boy to accomplish his dream so um it's good to have good parents like that na huh? thank god for parents like that if they scold you for your attitude just correct, get corrected while your father scolded you before your brothers throw you into the pit we'll come to the pit next week and uh, the week after that this is a good a good place uh, to get corrected when your father scolds you um number 4 the fourth observation 
that I want to make through, through this dream is this. That even though he had his dream when he was a 17-year-old boy, the dream got accomplished 40 years later. When he was an old man in chapter 50, Genesis chapter 50, he's talking to his brothers who are now bowing down to him in fear because they saw um, that Joseph had risen to this, um, this, this place of power. Um, he's, he's like the boss of the world at that point of time. Pharaoh was doing nothing. It was Joseph who was doing everything at that time. So Joseph literally ran the world. He's in this unimaginable state of power. Uh, and as they bowed down, exactly in fulfillment of what he dreamt at 17 years old, uh, and, and, and they were in, in fear begging him to offer forgiveness to them, he looks at them and he says this, Hey, it's not you. You may have intended to harm me, harm me, but God used that same thing to help me to become the kind of person that I become and to accomplish what he wanted to do through my life. And that is this, that he wanted me to be in this position to save you. The same people who tried to kill me to save you. Joseph realized this. Now, after 40, 45 years, 50 years, he's turning back, looking back at this, this long, arduous journey before he fully discovered what his dream actually meant. And that's something you need to remember. You may not be able to understand all the dreams that you receive. You may not be able to fully grasp what God is asking you to do. And it's okay. What you need to do is this. You have to begin to live your dream in order to discover what your dream means. Some of us have a, know that God spoke to you. Some of you know that this is God-given dream. But you are still waiting for God to explain that dream to you. He won't. You got to start taking the first step towards it. You see, God always reveals one step at a time. Thy word is a lamb unto my feet, not the street. My feet. Just the feet. That's how God works with us, one step at a time. You take the first step, then the second step, and the third step, and the fourth step. That's all. So you have to live it out, your dream, in order to discover what your dream means. Joseph had no idea what it really means other than he gets to be awesome when he was 17 years old. But that's all he could think, right? I'm the guy, I'm the guy, I'm the guy. I'm going to be awesome. Everybody's going to bow down to me. That's all he could think. But now he realized being awesome is not an easy thing. I've got to go through, I've got to be beaten black and blue, made a pulp before I can be remodeled into the kind of person that God wants me to be. So some of you are going to have a hard time. Um, sorry. And it's not going to be an easy one. It'll start off, take off well, then it'll take you to a pit, then it'll take you up, take you as a slave to a different location. There you will live like a slave for a long time, God knows how long, before you can begin to see some kind of success in your life. And then just as you're tasting the success, you'll go to a prison again, stay there in the prison for some more time, before you actually come out and walk into a palace, the place where God wants to take you. That's going to be a long one, but it'll be a good one. It'll be, a one, it'll be that one that you would turn back and say, thank God he didn't fulfill my dream when I was 17 years old. I would have messed up my life. I would have messed up everybody's life. But the journey is a good journey. So I beg you, I, we want to see every Capstonian to take that faith step towards your dream. And we want to help you in that way, in that process. What are the things that you can do? Learn from Joseph's life so that you don't have to repeat them uh, in your own personal life. You can learn quickly and apply them in your personal life in order to see your dream come into fulfillment. If you don't have a dream, it's okay. We pray that by the end of eighth week, you find a dream for yourself. That you'll have something to write on your blank napkin. You'll have something to draw on your 
blank napkin. You don't have to draw, you can write your dream, anything. But we want to see you doing that. So this is a very important piece of paper. Put it in your Bibles. Treat it like a Bible right now. <laughs> uh, I'm going to sound very heretical right now. <laughs> uh, just keep it in your Bible. Next eight weeks. Every time I open the book of Genesis, you got to see your napkin there. And something must be happening through this process. As uh, you know, by the time we finish our eight weeks of this series, we'll come to a place where you moved out of your center, of the, the center of your dream, and then God enters into the center of that dream. And the moment people begin to see God in the center of your dream, man, they're going to, they're going to stand around you and say, we are with you in this journey. And that will be a good one. So the question really is now today, if you already have a dream, who is at the center of your dream? That's the question I want you to think about. Take this moment to think. Close your eyes. If you already have a dream, ask yourself the question, who is at the center of my dream? Is it all about me? Is it all about me doing something, me being great, me being awesome? If you don't have a dream, ask God to give you a dream. He will. Today is a good day to have a dream. So ask God to give you a dream. A dream that would make a difference in this world through your life. You know, see, if you can have that mindset, God, use my life, use my skills in order to bring healing to the world. In this process of you becoming a a person of difference in this world. You get to be awesome too. But for that to happen, you got to move out of the center of your life, your dream. Let me pray with you.